The African-American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and religion. We'll explore how African-Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Bill Roden, who's a senior sports columnist at the New York Times. Glad to have you back again, hey, Bill. Hey, brother. Thank you so much. So many things happen about blacks in sports, and you do a great job of chronicling and commenting on those. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have Cam Newton in Auburn. We have Michael Vick with the <laughs> Philadelphia Eagles. We have uh, the coaching situation where black coaches are replacing white coaches. We have the whole business about colleges, which are penalizing athletes because they took money under the table. You've written about all those things. Which of those you think really reflects what the larger world thinks about the black athlete? Uh, Roscoe, that's a great question, as usual. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, you know what? Um, I, I think the quarterback situation historically, because, um, you know, uh, uh, football, pro football is the sport, is, is, is become our national pastime. Mm -hmm. And the most unique leadership position in sports, and I say globally, is the quarterback. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the quarterback is, is invested with all the things which I think a lot of times white men mm -hmm. uh, see themselves as being. Mm -hmm. Courageous, smart, grace under pressure, mm -hmm. all the things historically that, that, that white men and white people have used to define themselves is embodied in mm -hmm. the quarterback position, mm -hmm. which means what? Which means black folks can't play, mm -hmm. can't play it. And of all the, the, the positions that we have taken over mm -hmm. in mainstream sports, basketball, football, the one position, even in 2010, mm -hmm. that continues to be tough is quarterback. And you mentioned Michael Vick, and Cam Newton, uh, Don Auburn. And I, I think that Vic always represented just a, 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 um, a uh, tradition-shattering person mm -hmm. because this guy was the great, at any time, even now at age 30, he was the fastest person. He was probably the best athlete mm -hmm. on the football field, including defensive backs mm -hmm. and wide receivers. He was the fastest. Mm -hmm. He had a cannon of an arm. And just his whole approach to that position mm -hmm. threatened to really change the orthodoxy of how it was played. And I think for that reason, a lot of people kind of resented him. The same reason in corporate America, they might resent an African-American leadership position or even in the White House. Now, so, is, is this just because of intrinsic racism or is it something that the white community has learned over time because we have example after example that when African Americans are given the opportunity, they can do things as well or better than white folks. We can talk about Arthur Ashe, we can talk about Jackie Robinson, we can talk about the Tuskegee Airmen, we can talk about Colin Powell, we can talk about Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. So what is it in this culture that causes many in the white community, not all, to evaluate more seriously and more closely, the blacks who participate and perform rather than whites. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's intrinsic racism. Uh, and I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. African-American, white folks, Asian, I mean, mm -hmm. that there is this intrinsic racism in our society. And that's what we've been trying to exhume, you know, generation after generation. It's, it's a disease. And that's what it is. Mm -hmm. That racism that, that reacts negatively to African Americans, and particularly African American men, who mm -hmm. assume positions of power and mm -hmm. authority. And a lot of our kids don't understand it, whether it's Cam Newton or whether someday the, the president. What it is that as soon as I begun, begin to assume power, mm -hmm. there's this knee jerk force that mm -hmm. begins to kind of come after us. And, and, that, and that's what it is. Well, sometimes the white community says, well, when you. Black people get power, they tend to show off, like they dance in the end zone, like they speak. And uh, I don't necessarily believe that, but I know some white folks do think that. that. And some not, black folks think it, too. That's not, well, yeah, but that's, that, <laughs> but that's, not, uh, that's, not, that's not showing off. It's a celebration. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been, we, we celebrate, even, even uh, on the plantation during mm 
mm. uh, during corn shucking mm. uh, uh, festivals. Mm. You know, we, we celebrate life because life is so fragile. Mm. You know, and even in 2010, like life is fragile for people in general, but African Americans. So we mm. celebrate it. So mm. The touchdown, the dance, mm. it, it's not showing off. Mm. It's, it's it's a celebration of an accomplishment, mm. and it's and it's almost as if people would see it. So it's a party. It's it's mm. you know unless you're on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> you know. See, there's a culture shift. What this reminds me of is the Willie Mays. Willie Mays, you know, the Willie Mays is uh, excuse, you know, Willie Mays' basket, basket yeah, catch. Yeah. You know, now remember, you remember that people were like, oh my God, that's not what is he doing? Now? He's a hot dog. <laughs> he wasn't a hot dog. Mm -hmm. it, it was just merely a celebration of a new way of doing things. Yeah. And he was also very good at it too. Oh yeah, yeah, we can't drop it. That's the. But now <laughs> you went to South Africa to cover the world. Uh, Soccer championship. World Cup, yeah. And here we have the Vuvuzela, which made the noise that everybody learned about. The question I want to ask you, based on your experience in South Africa, how is racism different there than here in America? Yeah, that's, that's a, it, it's the power. It's the power. And mm -hmm. uh, Well, South Africa has the power. They have the numbers. They don't have the power. They have the, they have the In other words, the economic needle in terms of African, I mean, Africans, black Africans, has not really moved. And mm -hmm. I saw it almost immediately. I mean, the needle has moved like, <laughs> excuse me, this. And I, and I saw it immediately. And frankly, I went there looking for that to find out where is the power. And obviously, um, you know, the ANC has political power, but whites have the banks, the businesses, I mean, hotels, uh, the police. I mean, everywhere where I went, where I saw people giving commands and orders, Invariably, there were white folks, and, and, and in some way, it makes sense in that they were they've been doing this for like 400 years, you know. And here's the interesting thing: that I, I was there, and I was going through these great neighborhoods, and you have people there who are living deliciously. I mean, just <laughs> tremendously. And invariably, the best property, the best houses, are white. And I'm thinking, well, that's interesting. Over here in the United States, they say, well, of course, blacks aren't really in power because you're only 13 percent of the pop, uh, of the population. I said, well, okay, but now over there, the 97 percent of the population mm -hmm. is the same thing. So I'm like, wow, they've got it coming and going mm -hmm. both ways. And so, in fact, I was thinking, you know, I wrote the book $40 Million Slaves, and when I was going through I said, wow, there's a whole global dimension mm -hmm. of that, of even in South Africa almost being somewhat imprisoned economically in your mm -hmm. own country. I mean, you look at soccer. Now, now, football is a sport that all black South Africans play, but all the money in South Africa goes to what? Rugby mm -hmm. and cricket, mm -hmm. which is B predominantly white. and historically white with a couple mm -hmm. black, you know, and forget the Olympic sports like, you know, swimming and mm -hmm. golf, things like that. So, you know, I, I, you know, I was there for a month. Mm -hmm. At some points, I found myself getting demoralized. Uh, Either, I was either demoralized or angry. Mm -hmm. Depends on which side I woke up. Some days you woke up just angry. But, but there's an inevitability of numbers. Yeah, well, they got 35 million black folks over there, and uh, what, about 5 million white folks. They, they could really take over that country. The one thing that kept the uh, masses under control was the military, and the military is controlled by the white community. But it seemed to me at some point in time, the economic necessity of labor and distribution of those natural resources should force South Africa to change. And I think there are some people over there have been talking about that. Well, Did you see any evidence of change in economic power while you were there? You know, I saw some, not, not, no. not, not a lot. I mean, I, I spoke to um, several black businessmen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, you know uh, I had dinner a few times with, uh, with the Ron Galt, Ron and Charlene oh, yeah. Hunter Galt. Who, who, who live there, and there, there's a there's a small and growing um, black population. There, there's a group there called the Black Diamonds, mm -hmm. the Black Diamonds, which some blacks see as a sort of disparaging term, but it's it's this group of business people, this business class that's growing and expanding. The problem, I guess, you have is uh, to what extent will that group of blacks function to keep whites in power? Mm -hmm. And that's always our dilemma, even over here. Yeah. I mean, you know, the idea of people in power is how do we stay in power? And if we can break off a little 
crumb mm -hmm. to give to you to keep us in power, we'll mm -hmm. do it. And so although you have the inevitability of numbers, the, the thing is consciousness. Is there the sort of consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's within the, because there, there, there are battles, internecine battles yeah. within the ANC. Uh, um, so it's exciting. It's exciting, but in some ways, I look at I, I look at that situation. I look at our situation, and it's when I look there, it's almost like I see it's in 1950, 1960, and you could mm -hmm. almost see where this movie is going, just in terms of uh, the need to unify, mobilize, and then once you once you do that, you know, the idealism will will, will carry you through. But then mm -hmm. there comes a point where you have to produce. Well, you got to produce and, mm -hmm. you know. Well, that's where sports comes in. That's why African Americans do identify with sports because there's not economic power, it's intellectual and physical power. And as you say, games like football and baseball and basketball, which are dominated by African Americans, I maintain that if some people in the white community put as much emphasis on sports as we do in the black community, they have more outstanding white athletes because the range of human performance is a normal curve. And if you just take out a certain segment of it and develop that, it gets to be good. So then the question then comes up. When we turn to the college scene, where college big-time sports, uh, football and basketball, are really professional sports. They're minor leagues for the professional teams. The colleges pay off the athletes by giving them these scholarships Sometimes they may get an education and graduate, sometimes they're not. But now the colleges, and not now, but they've always paid under the table or on the side to get people to come to their colleges. Now, you wrote a piece that said that not only should the athlete be punished, or not mainly the athlete, but the people who give them money, to, like the administration and the representative of the administration. To what extent do you think that will happen? has a possibility of happening? Um, well, there, there's already legislation. I mean, I, yeah, I think that there should, I think boosters should be punished, but this is, this is just how this stuff is, talking mm. about the plantation. There's legislation now that the penalty will follow the athlete even into the pros. Mm. So when Reggie Bush uh, is, is discovered that he takes money on the table, even as he goes to the New Orleans Saints, the NCAA, the NFL, the NBA, they want to conspire mm -hmm. so that the punishment follows the athlete, even to the pros. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's right. I mean, I think mm -hmm. if, if you do that, the coach has to be punished too. Mm -hmm. Clearly. Know? All, but all this stuff in college athlete, athletics is designed to punish the athlete. You know, um, so, so that legislation, I think, is, that may, be, that may come sooner than the legislation to punish the agents. Because uh, I think if you're going to punish people, I mean, the athletes are sort of the lowest people on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. You're just, you know, 20, you know, 20 years old, 19, 18. A lot, a lot of times your family comes in a situation, comes from a situation where they, they need money. Mm -hmm. And you look at Cam Newton down at Auburn. Now, this guy, how many millions is it? What has he meant to <laughs> Auburn? Uh -huh. Sold out stadiums not only in Auburn, but sold out stadiums mm -hmm. everywhere they go. It's like a traveling road show. Mm -hmm. This guy is worth millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And they're like getting on his dad because his dad allegedly, allegedly mm -hmm. said, well, to Mississippi State, well, if mm -hmm. you want a, my son to come there, you're going to have to pay $180,000. We don't know that he said that. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a rumor. But you know what? Even if he did, $180,000 is like, mm -hmm. a, it's like a, it's not even a percent of what they'll be making off this kid. Mm -hmm. So the, in terms of the penalties, I think they always penalize the, the, the kid, and it's always in two sports for the most part. Mm -hmm. It's in basketball and football. Mm -hmm. Because those are the revenue-making sports. And, right? get, and get, they're the revenue-making sports, and guess what they support? Excuse me, they support the entire athletic department. Mm -hmm. Fencing. Tennis, field hockey, sports, by the way, which African Americans don't even, mm -hmm. aren't even involved with, mm -hmm. you know, but yet, and that's why it's sort of like, the, the, it looks like the plantation, mm -hmm. that you've got all these, like 70 to 80 percent of the black athletes lifting, doing heavy lifting on, on football mm -hmm. and basketball courts to support what? The country club sports of tennis, mm -hmm. no revenue, mm -hmm. 
uh, uh, field hockey, no revenue. Mm-hmm. Volleyball, no revenue, but 99% white. All right. I uh, wrote a book some 30-odd years ago advocating that the colleges pay their athletes instead of giving them scholarships. They would be able to go to school, but the main benefit, they'd get a salary at that time. I was just talking about $15,000 per athlete. Do you think that's a reasonable and even possible solution that you have 95 football scholarships and if you paid them $10,000 each, you got $9 million worth of, uh, of costs. Uh, would that help to change the way in which the uh, under-the-table operations go to try to pay them more money? I, w- I would think it would. I then the question is, would the colleges actually do that? Well, no, because it's just like, in, in, in this production or anything else, you want to keep your overhead low. Mm-hmm. And that's what the college want to do. Right now, they got the perfect situation. They have cheap labor mm-hmm. that's providing on-campus entertainment mm-hmm. that they don't have to pay anything for. You know, so all, to pay them all of a sudden. See, once you start paying them, now all of a sudden, mm-hmm. it, would, it would not be predominantly black anymore. Trust mm-hmm. me. It would Tr- be what? It would not be predominantly black okay. anymore. Football, mm-hmm. basketball, which are now predominantly black at your... At, at only at your division one upper division one level, mm-hmm. it, it is historically it is predominantly black. Right. Once you start paying and making it lucrative, mm-hmm. now all of a sudden it w- <laughs> trust me, it wouldn't be predominantly black mm-hmm. anymore. But to your question, uh, I, I for a long time I said no, no, no. You know, the education is the thing. Now I, I'm thinking, yeah, there probably should be some type of pay structure. The thing I think is the first thing they should do is. If your team in football, if your team goes to a bowl game, and these bowl games pay out yeah, five, yeah. six, seven, if you if you help your team get to a bowl game, you get a then I think you should get either a bonus or a percent or something. Because now mm-hmm. we're talking about money, ex, quote unquote, mm-hmm. extra money. Mm-hmm. And yes, you should as, as whether you're the fiftieth guy on the team or the top guy, there should be a, mm-hmm. a structure. Well, this brings up a question about why we have these revenue-producing sports in colleges. Uh, Basically, the money is used to support other sports. It doesn't really support the college, except the publicity to get some rich people who want to give them some money. In many of the European colleges, they don't have uh, teams representing the colleges. They have teams representing the talent. Uh, In a sense, that's probably what happens. And uh, Ohio State is representing Columbus. Michigan is representing Ann Arbor, uh, and the businesses get benefit from that. Is it intellectually dishonest to say that college athletics, particularly big-time sports, are really educational activities, or the professional accoutrements of education? Well, well, they are, well, well. As a as a structure, now first of all, I like the system. Mm-hmm. You know, I played football at Morgan and Morgan mm-hmm. State. You got an athletic scholarship, mm-hmm. and it it it. It was the greatest thing that's happened to me, and a lot of people will say that. But you got an education out of it. Well, and I, and I think that, to be honest with you, I think that, particularly historically black colleges, you, you, I think I think that I think that the majority of athletes oh. who go to HBCUs get an education. Mm-hmm. Um, for that's another show, but I think yeah. they do. Mm-hmm. But to your point, the the intellectual dishonesty comes from the fact. For example, you've got uh, departments of of, of uh, music. Departments of Drama, mm-hmm. and you can go to any university on any weekend, and you'll see uh, the music department put on a gala, mm-hmm. or you'll see the the, dra- the the drama department put on a show, and or, you know, and that's fine because on Monday, when you go to campus, you say, "Oh, here's the here's the uh, School of Drama. Yeah. Oh, well, here's the School of Music." Mm-hmm. But on Saturday, you go to the stadium, there'll be eighty five thousand people. Mm-hmm. But then when you go to campus on Monday, mm-hmm. you know, now where is this? Yeah. It doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. It's only a cash register. Mm-hmm. And that's because universities have not done what they did to schools of music a long time ago. And they mm-hmm. said, you know what? Let's take these things from your, um, uh, they, they used to be the, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, there would be, there would be, there would be a school mm-hmm. of music, but it wouldn't oh, be associated with the university. Right, that's right. They said, well, you know what? Let's take these, 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 Proprietary schools. So, and let's put them into the University of Michigan, the University of Indiana University. Mm-hmm. Well, they haven't done that with, 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 with athletics. They mm-hmm. just said, you know what, this is kind of like a prostitute. Mm-hmm. We're just going to, it's going to be a register, cash register, 
And, and I think that's the intellectual dishonesty, that mm. they haven't taken this multi-billion dollar industry and put it on mm. the college uh, campus as, as they've done with schools of music, art, and mm. drama. And that's why you see this sort of morass. All right, now I'm going to put you on the spot. To what extent has the media played a major role in this? Because back in the 19th century, teens played football, they didn't get much coverage, they didn't pay the athletes, they had students, and it was Harvard and Yale and Michigan, Ohio, and so on. All of a sudden, Notre Dame comes to New York, and they win some games, and they get to be the four horsemen, the publicity goes on, and all of a sudden, television comes in, you want to cover the uh, USC-UCLA game. The media, and not you particularly as a writer, well, but too. the I'm media nice has guy. made this important for the society. Is this a natural growth of uh, communication and intellect, uh, not intellectual, economic activity, or is it something that really reflects the fact that we want our gladiators? Well, that, that's, that, that's a great question. I mean, I, obviously, the media is the Wizard of Oz, mm -hmm. and that's what we do. We pump it up. You know, uh -huh. we, we pump it up, we, we promote it. But now, now remember, we also expose the scandal. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so mm -hmm. yeah, we kind of do it, we kind of have it both ways. And that's yeah. why the media always wins. Mm -hmm. We pump it up. You know, I mean, we, re we report on mm -hmm. the phenomenon of, of, of Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. You know, we do that. We report mm -hmm. on that and, and, and all the, uh, the tentacles mm -hmm. of, of race and, 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 and society that flow into that. But at the same time, will also bring down institutions too, uh, not just in sports, mm -hmm. throughout. But yeah, I mean, if you look at where we are in media today, and, and that's why when you have whether it's Michael Vick or Babe Ruth, could, for example, could not exist. He couldn't do the stuff he was getting away with <laughs> no, back then. No, no. He, it, it would be terrible. He would last a week mm -hmm. with that kind of stuff. So yeah, we, we pump it up. We, we glorify things. And then at the same time, like now violence. You look at the issues of violence mm -hmm. in professional football now. Now, you know, this time last year, you had ESPN. We were, we had segments about violence. violence yeah. Oh, look at this! <laughs> we show the hits. Oh man! Well, now, what do we do? We turn we turn around and say, "Oh, this is terrible! Uh -huh. You know, it's awful! Uh -huh. They got to do something about these these hits." Uh -huh. We kind of have it both. That's how we we kind of have it both ways. We'll uh -huh. we'll talk about racism. Uh -huh. We'll investigate racism. But if you come through our newsroom uh -huh. and you see no black folks, you know, we don't. You know, so that's. That's a very important point. The media does not actually have a proportionate number of minority and women reporters. Will that ever change? I know it will change, but how long will it take for it to change? Uh, Population alone will, you know, the demographics will make it change because it's not going to be that, there'll be more minorities who qualify. But to what extent do you think it might change in the past, in the next 10 years, let's say? You know, Roscoe, I think that this media business that we're in is probably, outside of the economic institutions, probably the most important, significant institution in this country in terms of defining things. And mm -hmm. I think because of that, and I'm not talking about minorities, I'm talking about African Americans. Mm -hmm. I think because of that, it's, it's, a, it's going to be a tremendous, mm -hmm. a tremendous fight to get mm -hmm. African Americans in these places in positions of power mm -hmm. and authority. You can go to any press box on any given Sunday, you know, and if you walk through these press boxes, right, you will be astounded. You think that you were in Mississippi yeah. in 1958 in terms of the lack of an African American presence. You go to our news departments mm -hmm. and you begin to look for people who are, of, of, who are African American in positions of power and control who determine what you read, not only what you read, but the slant, yeah. the coverage. Uh, I think that that is a tremendous war that we're not really aware of as, 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 as a people. I think we're kind of aware of it, but mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're not really aware to the extent of, of forming uh, an army to actually fight it. Well, this represents a new civil rights movement. We've done education, we've done health care. Maybe we need to do something about journalism. And I think people like you and people like myself will be keep talking about this and raising the awareness. The other thing is we've got to get some of our young people prepared to go into the journalism industry. And that is where we can do that with the few African-American papers, uh, radio, 
and the universities because to be prepared is necessary to go to the next step. And you were prepared. You had great experience. You were in your college. You wrote in sports papers and so on. So what we need to do is to carry that message that even though it is difficult, it's not impossible. Well, you know, here, here's, a, here's an issue, and this is, another, this is another story for another program, but I think that's the, I, I went to an African-American college, uh, and I worked for an African-American newspaper, mm -hmm. and then I worked the for African Ebony American. The, the, yeah, the Afro-American, <laughs> then Ebony Magazine. Uh, I, I think that you've got a lot of bright kids at, at a lot of, you got, you know, how many historically black colleges you have in, in the country? Mm -hmm. I think you've got, you know, a lot of kids who would be good. The problem is that as your black institutions disappear mm -hmm. because of integration, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and the institutions, you know, like the Times, the Washington mm -hmm. Post, these great media institutions are not, are not uh, bringing us in in the same numbers that, the, you know, percentage-wise that the mm -hmm. Afro did or Ebony, mm -hmm. you know. So I think it's, and, and, you know, because I think they got to, yeah, again, you walk through the news, you look at the internship programs, you look at all the young white journalists mm -hmm. who are kind of coming through, uh, or, or, or journalists of any ethnic group except African Americans. So I think it's, it's preparation, yes, but I think it's beyond preparation. Well, it's access and opportunity. See, that's a great challenge I wish to end the day's program. We've been talking with Bill Roden from the New York Times, and you're talking about the issues that black athletes and black community face. Thanks again for being with us, and also <laughs> thanks for the... <laughs> There you go. Don't get worried about that. <laughs>